Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us here today with National History Academy. My name is Katie Smolar, and I'm the Director of Educational Programs with the Academy. And today on our virtual history, American History series, we are fortunate enough to be joined by Saratoga National Historical Park. And we are with uh, Ranger Bill today, who is the Education Program and Volunteer Coordinator for the park. So Bill, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for the invitation to join you all today. Are we ready to go? And we are ready to go whenever you are. Okay, very good. Thank you. Get the screen share going here. So the presentation today, we're talking from the perspective of Saratoga National Historical Park, and many people just know of us as Saratoga Battlefield. We'll be looking at the history, a little bit of the history of the Battles of Saratoga in the autumn of 1777, more on those dates in a bit. And we'll be looking at this from a particular perspective, as the name on the screen implies, loyal to whom? So this will be a look at the Battles of Saratoga through the lens of loyalties in the American War for Independence. And to set our story in context, we are, here we go with a map of New York State and little old Saratoga National Historical Park appearing in the red oval on the far left, yeah, far right side of the map there as you're looking at it. We are about three hours drive north of New York City. Uh, rather feels like we're in the middle of nowhere only because we are. So setting the stage, Declaration of Independence with, well, we had been 13 British colonies, and then in July of 76, uh, something completely different happened. We declared our independence, and then the question became, all right, so to whom are you loyal? A whole new way of looking at our little corner of the world. Now, for working definition, we could look at loyalty in terms of a feeling or a sense of being connected with, concerned for, and seeking the good of another, be it another person, organization, group, what have you, and wanting to be associated with that other. Of course, Great Britain's perspective on the Declaration of Independence, we are not amused and you owe your loyalty to us. Of course, we had been British colonies and in their perspective, we still were. We were just being naughty children. And so they decided they really needed to do something about these rebelling American colonies. And the map you see on the left of the screen is the larger geographic corridor from New York City all the way up to Canada uh, in all this area involved with the British invasion of New York in 1777. So Great Britain's grand plan for the year, they're going to be using waterways, which in many ways were highways of their days, using several waterways to invade New York from Canada following the Lake Champlain, Hudson River Valley, the first red oval you're seeing on your screen. Also, the Mohawk River Valley, running from east, uh, west to east, along the middle part of New York there. They are basically reversing their playbook from the French and Indian War. They had left Albany to head north into French-held territory invading all the way up into Canada in some cases, and a number of raids. Now, with holding Canada after the French and Indian War, they're flipping the playbook around. They're going from Canada to Albany. And from there, they had multiple options. The yellowish rectangle here over New England, nobody knew on the American side what the British might do, but they had many options once they had gotten down to Albany potentially isolating New England or maybe even invading. Nobody knew. Realistically, the British weren't quite sure either, but they had options open to them. So you'd have General John Burgoyne moving south by the Lake Champlain and Hudson River Valley from Canada to Albany. There's the red arrow appearing north to south on the map. Then we have Colonel Barry St. Ledger moving from the 
western part of New York along the Mohawk River Valley towards Albany, and then General Sir William Howe, later his second in command, General Clinton, moving north a little ways from the city of New York. Although that move along the Mohawk River Valley, eh, that didn't go quite so well. That got halted at Fort Stanwix out in Rome, New York today, American fortifications there. That move for north from New York City at short distance, they didn't make it very far either. They got turned around uh, not too far north of the city, having to go back down to the city. And then that move south out of Canada, halted by the Americans at the Battle of Saratoga. So there we've got the little red explosion icon there around Saratoga on that map. So here's a close up map of the battlefield today. This is from our modern park uh, map and brochure. But back in 1777, there were a number of things happening. Now on the 12th of September, American forces built fortification, sort of in the bottom or southern part of the map. You see that bluish almost looks like a staple and then a dash next to that. Those markings represent something close to two miles of six foot tall log walls. How many tens of thousands of trees were cut down, telephone pole sized trees to build that massive fortification. One week later, the 19th of September, the British forces under General Burgoyne moved in in three separate columns, starting to move south. And there you see those red arrows sort of towards the top part of the map. They're trying to sweep around the American defensive lines. Uh, however, American forces anticipated that move and met them at the Freeman Farm, the first day of the battle, September 19th, often called the Battle of Freeman's Farm. So we've got that red explosion icon there around Freeman's Farm. Uh, by the end of the day, the British pushed the Americans back to their own fortifications. End of day one, a British victory, technically, since they held the field. Uh, bigger picture, the Americans kept the British from getting further south, so take it as you like. Two and a half weeks later, October 7th. Oh, wait, that's like tomorrow, isn't it? Yes, 244 years tomorrow. The second day of the battles started as British forces who had built fortifications for themselves, kind of on the northern part of the battlefield, moved out of two of those fortifications, the Balcaris Redoubt, right there on John Freeman's farm, and the nearby just north of that Bremen Redoubt, trying to sweep again around the left side of the American lines, but they didn't make it very far. They got down to a field of ripened wheat ready for harvest and being low on food, the British forces stopped across those fields and harvest or tried to harvest the wheat. The Americans spotting that movement moved north out of their fortifications and attacked. That was the first contact on the second day of the battles, the 7th of October, sometimes called the Battle of Bemis Heights. We'll talk more about Bemis Heights in a bit. It's sort of where the British were heading, but they never made it there. The high water mark for General Burgoyne's army was the Barber Wheat Field. There's our explosion icon showing the hostilities there. The American forces would end up being able to push the British back. Most of the British fled to the Balcaris Redoubt, a little less than a mile away. So there's the red arrow showing the fallback to the Balcaris Redoubt. Uh, that position held out against the Americans. The nearby Bremen Redoubt, however, just a bit further north of that, did not. Just about sundown on the 7th of October, there we go, even larger explosion icon there for the fighting at the Bremen Redoubt. Just about sundown, that position fell to the American attackers. But that was at the far right side of all the British lines, meaning the British defenses were vulnerable to their rear all the way back to their river defenses. And so that night under cover of darkness and into the next day, the British forces would be heading back a little further east to their own river defenses. There's those red arrows showing the British forces falling back to their river defenses. And then by the next night, the 8th of October, they are in full retreat headed north back up the Hudson River Valley. They were hoping to get about 60 miles to Fort Ticonderoga, which they captured on their way south, the nearest friendly faces as there were some British troops and cached supplies there. 
but they never made it. They only traveled about eight miles north, finding themselves in the village of Saratoga, Schuylerville, New York today, finding their escape route cut off by American forces already there. A couple of days later, the Americans moved up the valley behind them and the British were surrounded and they surrendered on the 17th of October, 1777, the first time in history a whole British army had ever had to surrender. It's this American victory that won critical international recognition and help. 1778, France became our legal ally. 1779, Spain got involved in the conflict on the side of the French. 1780, the British declared war against the Netherlands for trading with Britain's enemies in wartime. 1781, there's fighting as far away as Southern India. Some of the principalities there banded together and pushed back against the British. This American victory turned a civil uprising into a global conflict. And the painting you see here is a, an artist's depiction few years after the battle, 1791, an artist's depiction of the American victory with General Burgoyne surrendering his sword to General Gates, what you're seeing in the middle of the picture there. That picture, by the way, is also found in the Capitol Rotunda down in DC. So everybody was in favor of independence, right? Well, loyalty was not quite as simple a matter at the battles of Saratoga and the time shortly before that. It was actually kind of complicated. Now, after the Declaration of Independence, there were three main loyalty perspectives in the US. There were royalists, supporters of the British rule, and varying figures I've seen list as many as maybe one fifth of the population of the country at the time were royalists. There were some people attempting to maintain neutrality. Same numbers, roughly one fifth of the population, give or take. The remaining three fifths or so were supporters of independence. They wanted the United States to exist as its own separate country. So three main loyalty perspectives. And even a year later, those big differences were a huge issue here at the battles of Saratoga or in the area where the battles would take place. You see here, we had a unique situation. All three loyalty perspectives were located within less than two miles of each other. That's our lens for looking at the battles of Saratoga. Now there were several farm areas of importance to the story of the battles. And if you are on our tour road today, shown on the map inset here as the thin blue line uh, meandering through the battlefield, that's our self-guiding driving tour. There's three main areas of significance for the story of the battles of Saratoga. And if you were on the tour, you'd be seeing the following in sequence. First, the farm of one John Nielsen and his loyalty perspective, he was a supporter of independence, as we have the stylized US flag showing up on the, on the screen. Now, a, th a question to interact with wherever you find yourselves sitting, standing, taking in this presentation. Here's a question you can think about. To whom are you loyal? See, even as students, you could feel loyal to any number of others, as we mentioned earlier, individuals, groups, et cetera. You might feel loyalty to family, friends, your school, your pets, a scout group, a sports team, your state, your country, a faith group of some kind, lots of different possibilities many of them overlapping even in your lives. Back to John Nielsen's story for a bit. Now this little red farmhouse shown in this picture 
There's a cannon on the side lawn, a large tree in the front yard. There's a few white marker posts with blue tops. Uh, those white posts represent fortified lines. We'll talk more about those. We talked about them briefly. We'll talk about them a little more. This little red farmhouse is the only building we have on the battlefield from the battles of Saratoga. John and his wife Lydia had built this around 1775, quaint little one room farmhouse. Uh, this actually would have been middle class housing in its day. Now, John was a sergeant in the local Albany County Militia Regiment, the 13th Albany County Militia Regiment. Now, militia were part time military service members, and it was required by law for all able-bodied men age 16 to 50 to serve a certain amount of militia duty every year and they'd be doing so in their regiments groups of about 300 soldiers and the members had to train and practice and serve a certain amount of time every year and be ready to respond in case of a possible threat that's really no different than let's say modern volunteer fire service today fire companies with the volunteer membership. It's no different. We are required to train and to practice, and then we turn out in case of an emergency. You know, these county militias were a critical part of public safety and defense, and just like the Continental Army soldiers, regular soldiers in it for the duration, they're an important part of General Horatio Gates's forces at the Battle of Saratoga. Well, here's a short excerpt from the Colony of New York Militia Law, a little before the battle, the Declaration of Independence and the Battles of Saratoga. It was on the law books. It was so important. Militia duty was so important. It was required by law. Now, you notice this line, uh, second or third line from the bottom with the red oval, referring to every person from 16 to 50 years of age. Bear in mind that by person, it meant men, women were not required to serve in the militia, but more on the women's roles a little later on. And there were a number of misspellings in the original document. So if you happen to catch any of those or poor grammar, yep, that's original from the document. Back over to John Nielsen. During the Battles of Saratoga, he was, and I always wondered where this term came from and working here at Saratoga Battlefield, I found out. What is a teamster? Comes from this particular usage. He was leading a team of oxen with a wagon, bringing needed supplies from Albany to the American defenses. These teamsters were bringing teams of horses or oxen, shuttling supplies. Today, they're truck drivers bringing whatever goods are on the trucks. Now, the American defenses, again, I did say I'd mention this again, massive wall of logs and earth running right through his property toward the property of his neighbor, Jotham Bemis. So here's a detail of the battlefield map in the lo lower left corner. Here's that the staple shape showing the fortified line. Upper left corner of that is Nielsen's farm. And just below the right end of the line, there's a red circle for Jotham Bemis's farm and property. And the two men knew each other. They were in the same militia regiment. But things got a little awkward. Early in 1777, Jotham Bemis did not show up for mandatory militia duty. And his neighbor, John Nielsen, had to pay Bemis a little visit and collect mandatory fines from him. Awkward. Moving on to Bemis's story. Back to the battlefield map here, lower, slightly rightish part of the map. Lower right corner almost. Jotham Bemis, drum roll. And the icon on the screen says neutral. Question for your consideration. When in your life have you witnessed examples of disloyalty? Even as students, you may have witnessed it in, for example, a one-time friend acting badly toward another, 
to gain the approval of others, or a student stealing from another, or a student saying negative things about another behind that person's back, maybe social media posts spreading false information about another student, maybe someone who regularly doesn't live up to the promises they make, maybe a student cheating off another's test, all examples, maybe multiple examples you might be familiar with. I'll back over to Bemis a little bit. At the battles of Saratoga, the American Army's powerful defenses were anchored on this ridge called Bemis's Heights. And here's a picture of that ridge. There's a couple of modern copies of cannons representing the many American cannons on this ridge. And there's a couple of these white marker posts, again, representing the fortified lines here. And the cannons looking away from us, from our vantage point, looking over and toward the Hudson River and the river valley below. You can't see the river because of the line of trees in the middle of the picture there, uh, but it is there. American cannons on these heights were the anchor of the American defenses, and those cannons could rain artillery fire down on the valley below, and the ridge would later be named for Bemis's family. Here's that same picture of Bemis's heights and the ridge here, but we're going to include some photos from a special event many years ago where we had some volunteers firing a cannon. Okay, we don't have the firing here, but we do have a section of fortified line rebuilt. Here we have the white marker post with blue tops and a section of log wall with a cannon on a wooden platform behind it. The notch in that wall allows the cannon to fire through the wall down onto the valley below. That's what the view would look like behind the cannon. Here's what the view would look like in front of the cannon. Not a view you want to have. Talk about being on the wrong side of it. Well, what would the fortified line look like in length? Uh, Ranger Bill had some fun with Photoshop a while back. And this picture shows this lengthy stretch, couple stretches of fortified line, long stretches of log wall with cannons behind them, one on top of the ridge and one along the flat part of the floodplain here. The Americans completely dominated the river valley. No way could the British get through here. Now, back to Bemis, since this is Bemis's Heights. Originally from Connecticut, Jotham Bemis was a veteran of the French and Indian War, and he and his wife, Trofina, had three sons and a daughter. They ran a nearby tavern the equivalent today of a hotel, restaurant, a pub, and a meeting house, uh, kind of like a chat room. Now, at the time of the War for American Independence, all of his sons were in the American Army, regular soldiers or militia, and in fact, Jotham was still old enough to serve in the militia. But as I noted earlier, twice in early 1777, he did not show up for mandatory militia duty. And John Nielsen, his nearby neighbor, had to collect fines from him. Now remember, the militia law is dated to 1775, so as British colonies' monetary amounts were listed in British pounds, the first fine was 10 pounds, the second fine 20 pounds in modern money, uh, in excess of $5,000. That's an inexpensive used car. Bemis paid the fines, but later during the battles of Saratoga, he wasn't even here at home. He was on board a prison ship on the Hudson River, not far north of New York City. The charges that got him there, disloyalty to the state of New York. In the next couple of years would be tough for Bemis and his family. There were many accusations against him of contact with and sympathy for the British. He was in jail several times before being released on bail. And even his second wife, Hannah, don't know what happened to his first wife, but even his second wife was similarly accused. The charges did not stick. To whom were they loyal? We may never know. Back to the battlefield map. We mentioned Freeman Farm earlier. 
John Freeman and his family, their farm sort of on the northern part of the battlefield. The little picture there says they were royalists. Question for contemplation. What is a difficult decision you have had to make? As students, you may have had occasion to choose to tell the truth when a lie seemed easier, to be kind to a person even when others aren't, to say no to something even when others want you to do it, seeing someone dropping money but returning it instead of keeping it, doing something you know is right even if others disagree, maybe helping someone when you'd rather do something else. Now for John Freeman, he and his wife Ethelina, they had arrived here some years before 1768. They started leasing, kind of like renting this property from a wealthy local landowner by the name of Philip Schuyler. If any of you are familiar with Hamilton the musical, yep, it's the same Philip Schuyler. And the Freemans would begin farming the land. Oh, and the picture here, white marker posts, red tops. So we're now looking at British lines. There's several cannons here as well, representing British artillery. John Freeman by 1777 had several children, the oldest of whom Thomas, 12 years old. That's a couple of years younger than you all. Now, when they, like everyone else in the area, found out there's a British army heading down this way, they moved out of harm's way. But as royalists, they didn't see these troops as invaders, but the king's forces. And in fact, in autumn of 1777, as the Freemans moved north, John and his son Thomas joined up with General Burgoyne's British forces as part of a royalist unit, the king's loyal Americans. If any of you are thinking, wait a minute, Thomas was only 12 years old, you're right. The musket he was carrying was about as tall as he was, but he was in the first day of fighting in the battles of Saratoga. He was removed from the line on the following day. They got him out of harm's way. Strange irony of the battles of Saratoga, both days of the battles took place at least partly on Freeman's farm. The image in front of you now is an original British map from General Burgoyne's army at the battles of Saratoga. You'll see a red circle show up on the map, uh, sort of right of center and a little bit low. That's Freeman's house. And the red dotted line you're, show, you're seeing here, it looks like a bent staple. That's the fortified line. That is the Balcaris Redoubt. And yeah, it bumped right up against the walls of Freeman's house. The ironies continue on the second day of the battles, October 7th, that's tomorrow, 244 years ago, their house was all but destroyed. The Freemans were not able to return. They continued north towards Canada as a lot of Royalist Americans did. Unfortunately, smallpox, horrible disease, raging through the area at the time. Stories say that it killed most of the family, leaving young Thomas, 12 years old, to take care of two younger siblings. The good news, we've had a number of Freeman family descendants visiting Saratoga National Historical Park, wanting to see the old family farm. So we know that, yes, some of the family did survive. I've talked to some of the descendants, and they are very eager to come out and see where the farm was. In conclusion, the battles of Saratoga are known as the turning point of America's war for independence. You may have heard some other sites talking about being the turning point of the Revolutionary War. Little historical background, the first time the term turning point of the Revolutionary War was ever used was in a 1930s history book, and it was created to describe the battles of Saratoga. We really are the turning point of the Revolutionary War. 
But this also was still early in the war. It would be another six years until the Treaty of Paris. Okay, realistically, treaties, plural. I mentioned earlier those other countries getting involved in this conflict. They had their own treaties to sign. This was one big story, one big picture made up of many smaller pictures and individual stories. For example, here we have on the screen door number one, door number two, and door number three. What's behind door number one? The picture you see here is of at a modern living history program, a Native American fellow, in fact, a member of the Oneida Nation of New York. And the Oneidas, even before France became our first legal ally, the Oneida Nation, by word of mouth, were America's first allies. And they are extremely proud of that status and extremely proud of having had members of their nation fighting in the United States military as long as there's been a United States to have a military. The fellow you see here in this picture, five years United States Marine Corps in the first Gulf War. Door number two, the rather dapper looking fellow you see here is of a black soldier who fought at the battles of Saratoga many years before, a man named Agrippa Hull. One in every 20 continental soldiers at the battles of Saratoga were men of African descent, black soldiers fighting integrated in the ranks. 5% of the Continental Army at Saratoga, men of African descent, same uniforms, same food, same muskets, same tents. You're a soldier, you're a soldier, you're a soldier. There was no difference. And you'd have groups of four or five soldiers sharing a tent, groups that they called messes. They shared tents, they shared cooking duties. Maybe that's where our term mess kit came from for a cooking kit. You could have one or two of them, black soldiers with white soldiers, made no difference whatsoever. You're a soldier, you're a soldier, you're a soldier. And this fellow Agrippa Hall, well after the war, was an extremely successful businessman. He and his wife, very wealthy, so much so that in the early 1830s, 40s, he was able to afford to have a photograph taken of himself. Yes, you didn't have iPhones and droids with the simplicity of a 10 megapixel picture. It was very expensive to have a photo taken, and he did. And not only did he have a photo taken, he had this painting done of himself, this portrait done based on that photo. He and his wife did very well for themselves. Real success story, directly tied back to the battles of Saratoga. And door number three, I did say I'd talk about them later. Well, it's later. Women were not serving in the military, but they did have critical roles as what were called followers of the army, sometimes called camp followers. They were support staff. Now the soldiers, I did mention a moment ago, the soldiers, in those messes, those groups of four or five soldiers, the soldiers are doing their own cooking. The followers were doing their own cooking, but they were helping with support tasks, like helping with laundry for the soldiers, mending, sewing soldiers' uniforms if they needed repair. And sometimes the followers might even assist in the hospital, the military hospital, taking care of sick or injured soldiers. How important were these roles? I've seen documentation for eh, getting around 1779, 1780 to establish what today we would call minimum wages, minimum amounts that these followers were supposed to be paid for their work doing laundry. Their roles were that important. Many different stories, many different pictures. Each of you watching, listening, you have your own story that makes you, you.
these were real people with real stories that made them them. History is not about long ago and far away. It's about the stories of real people like you and me. Real people, real stories, and a big picture. And for all of those real people, 244 years ago, all of their individual stories, all interconnected by an essential question, loyal to whom? Thank you, each and every one of you, wherever you're at, you are the very first multiple site audience for whom Saratoga National Historical Park has been able to offer this distance learning experience. Thank you. And we'll be opening the floor to some questions. All right, Bill, thank you so much. That was wonderful to be a part of. Uh, we do have some questions here. Uh, first of all, have they done any archaeological digs at the battlefield? And if so, what have they found? Oh boy, lovely question. <laughs> There's been a lot of archaeology done many years ago. Uh, we're not we're not a pristine site. There are many layers of history, and there was no preservation of the battlefield for 150 years until mid 1920s, late 1920s, when just a few farms were purchased for preservation purposes. And in 1927, we became a state historic site. So there was some archeology span done limited amounts then, not really much. And there was more archeology span done when we, after we became a national park service site in 1938, uh, 1950s, there was a lot done, uh, 40s and, and some in the 50s. Uh, there's not been a whole lot done since then. There were some done in the 1980s, and we had actually uh, some of you may have seen in news feeds we just finished up a few weeks ago with an archaeology program with a group of veterans uh, it involved a very strong focus on non-invasive non-intrusive imaging techniques ground penetrating radar uh, the same group was here two years ago lidar kind of like radar but using laser light pulses for mapping uh, science and technology and history working together. It's a beautiful thing. Uh, metal detecting work. Uh, I have not yet seen the report on their findings. We're hoping though that will become available in the near future. I don't have a timeline on that, I'm afraid, but great question. Next. All right. Who built the fortifications and how long did it take uh, them to build them? The fortifications were built by the soldiers on their respective sides. So they would have been set up in work parties of dozens of soldiers and really hundreds of soldiers when it comes right down to it, cutting down thousands of trees and they weren't using chainsaws because of course those didn't exist. They were using hand operated saws uh, if you've seen living history programming at museums or other historical sites you may have seen those very large wide bladed saws with a wooden handle on either end meant to be operated by two people uh, the nickname for them i've heard uh, more than once uh, was a misery whip and if you've ever tried using one you know where it comes from uh, a dozen cuts back and forth and I had blisters. Yeah, not a lot of fun. So using saws and axes and digging holes, it was extremely hard, time consuming work. It sounds like a lot of work. You, uh, you mentioned a lot of the personal stories. Are there a lot of surviving firsthand accounts, written accounts of what happened there? We're thankful that there are some very good first person accounts uh, some were written not too long after the battles others were written later 
uh, some information we have, maybe not directly for the battles, but similar from other soldiers' stories elsewhere. Uh, thankfully, at Saratoga, there were several uh, journals, several officers' journals, and we also, as I mentioned, the followers of the army earlier. There's also a unique account. Almost never did officers' wives go along with the armies, but at the battles of Saratoga, uh, there was a contingent of General Burgoyne's British army, a uh, little less than a third, who were German auxiliaries. German soldiers, very often they're called Hessians, uh, kind of a, a nickname most of the German soldiers rented, leased, if you will, by King George III of England, were from one main German province called Hesse Kassel. We Americans, well, we're not big on long, difficult to pronounce names, we called them Hessians. At Saratoga, there were no soldiers from Hesse Kassel. The majority were from the, pro there were a small number from a nearby province, Hessen Hanau. The majority were from the province of Brunswick, the Brunswickers. The wife of the general commanding the German forces at Saratoga, Baroness Frederica von Riedesel. Fascinating read. Her journal is in print. It's great historical information. It's also great human interest stories. There are other journal, uh, journal entries, uh, or journals in general, from a number of uh, soldiers and off or mostly officers on both sides of the, of the conflict. That leads into this other question here. Uh, do you have any books you'd recommend for those hoping to learn more about what happened there? There, is, there, there are some very good books out there. There is uh, our, I'm not sure if it's something that uh, your local library might have available, perhaps available through an interlibrary loan, uh, but the Park Handbook called Decision on the Hudson uh, is, a, is a very good book. Uh, I just mentioned the Baroness von Riedesel's. That's R-I-E-D-E-S-E-L. Baroness von Riedesel's book. Uh, is also good. Uh, there's a couple of other a uh, couple of other possibilities. Uh, if you'd like, I could certainly send you a list of them for posting. Probably That's the great. easiest way to do it. Yeah, that would be great, and I can add it after it's back to uh, in the comments. That would be great. Noted. All right. Um, Literally noting now. Oh, perfect. <laughs> Note to self. Okay. I was trying to write them down while you said it, but this would probably be easier. <laughs> uh, what work today goes into preserving the site? Everything from mowing the lawns to making sure all the staff gets paid to site interpretation, telling the cool historical stories, to protecting the resource from potential damage, helping to protect visitors who are visiting, and learning more about the stories, talk about the archaeology, but there's also more research being done. There's pr site preservation there. At our park, we're not just the battlefield. We also have American General Philip Schuyler's country estate, about eight miles north of the battlefield. Uh, hearkening back to Hamilton the musical, at one point, one of the daughters references to Hamilton, come visit the house, our house upstate. We're it. Yeah, there you go. We also have a 155-foot obelisk, the Saratoga Monument, Victory Woods, a half-mile pathway through where the British made their final encampment before their surrender, and then the site where General Burgoyne surrendered his sword to General Gates just became part of our park this past spring. So there's always more work going on, and as I mentioned to you uh, in preparation for this program, doing educational programs, doing interpretive programs, these are ongoing as well, and they're all part of the bigger picture of preservation and helping to build a new generation of people who care, a new generation of stewards who know about the site and feel a connection to the site and want to help protect the site.
Congratulations, all of you who have been viewing this presentation, listening to this presentation. You are now part of that audience. Thank you. Thank you. So that, that's great, too. and I'm sure a lot of us are familiar too now with, uh, thanks to Hamilton. Do we know if he ever actually visited? <sighs> when he first, one of his early tweets about the musical, he did mention the house in Albany. I took, that was the family's main home, was their mansion in Albany. It is not directly connected with us. It is a New York State historical site. Uh, we are a National Park Service site. I did respond to his tweet inviting him to come visit. Never heard back from him. Don't know if he ever visited. So I can't say one way or the other, but as many people have pointed out, he's a very busy man. That's great. And uh, Bill, we'll just do one final question here sure. for you. Um, do you kind of a two-parter, would you mind sharing sort of your personal story, how you got involved with the park and then any uh, advice you'd have for uh, some of the future historians out there who maybe want to get into the world of either national parks or preservation or anything like that? How did I get into this? Okay, I probably should have given everyone an early warning. Uh, I was a teacher before becoming a park ranger. Uh, my undergraduate work was in American history. My graduate work is in education. Yep, certified social studies teacher way back in the day. Uh, master's in education and then was teaching. And I got into the field when a few too many people got into, uh, got into the field. So I ended up teaching environmental education for a couple of years. And then a friend of mine, circumstances, coincidence, uh, was doing a, an internship at Saratoga National Historical Park with a park biologist, a ranger position open, and he called me saying, hey, this position is open. I'm not qualified for it. You are. You're coming home this weekend to fill out the application form, which I did. Uh, the rest is history. That was 24 years ago. So I've been with the park for quite some time. My background in education, my background in history, my background in environmental studies, it all came together and has served me very well here. For anyone who's interested in getting into this line of work, uh, anything you can do to build your resume. One, it's on the resume. No one's gonna take it away from you. Two, it can be helpful doesn't matter what kind of site you're going to. There are history sites, there are cultural sites, there are natural history sites throughout the Park Service. And you've got lots of related sites that are not National Park Service, whether they're state sites. Virginia's got some great examples. Uh, good on you for that. Uh, you do a great job with it. Uh, other states do a great job with it as well. Uh, find what interests you what sparks a fire in you and start looking in those directions. Look for opportunities to volunteer, look to study, look to learn more, take some of those classes, uh, look at some of those online lectures, webinars, visit those sites, oh my goodness. Uh, my parents used to bring my brother and myself to historical sites when we were growing up. Look what happened to me. Any opportunities that you can to learn, take advantage of them. Volunteer, you go to any national park site, they're gonna say the same thing. Volunteering is no guarantee of getting in, but it does give valuable background experience, and it could give you one up on someone who maybe doesn't have that experience, that background. If you're looking for a permanent position in the park service, in my line of work, you gotta have a four year degree of some kind. In what field? Well, it depends. I work at a Revolutionary War site. My background in American history uh, helped out very, very well. If you're looking to get into a Civil War site, Civil War background is going to serve you very well. If you're looking to get to an arts site, uh, Wolf Trap, uh, it's a site that's all about theater. That, if you've got a background in theater and sharing stories, interpretation, helping people, helping visitor, visitors make connections, doesn't matter the site, that's going to help. You wanna to go to a biology uh, site, uh, uh, an ecology site, a geology site, get 
background in those fields. It's great advice. Thank you for sharing. And Bill, thank you again so much for being with us today and taking us on this journey out of Saratoga with you. My pleasure. Thank you for the invitation and thank you all for being with us today. Again, it's a great opportunity for me as well. So thank you. Really appreciate it. And thank you all for joining us today and make sure we'll come back tomorrow at 4 p.m. We'll be continuing our Hispanic Heritage Month program with a virtual tour with Cesar e. Chavez National Monument. Thank you everyone and enjoy the rest of your day.